Well, after all that has taken a place in the news over the last week, I came here in desperate need of the gospel. And we've gotten that today. And what we've sung and what we've prayed, we've gotten it today in the talk that Jackson just gave to us, which was so good, I almost thought to then get up and preach would be superfluous but I'm going to preach anyway because the sermon I have to preach for you this morning is priceless. Certainly not because of the guy who's preaching it, but because it's a sermon about two stories that Jesus told that Brett read for us today in Matthew 13. At least, I think it was Brett. It didn't sound like Brett. It didn't sound like the Brett I remember, but whoever that was, that imposter that was up here with that melodious, resonant bass voice, what he read to us this morning is what I want to talk with you about. The theme of Jesus' preaching was that we should repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus not only preached about the kingdom, he also crafted stories about the kingdom, which are called parables. And here in Matthew chapter 13, he tells two of those brief stories. The story of the hidden treasure in verse 44, and the story of the pearl of great value in verses 45 and 46. I want to talk with you this morning about these parables and some lessons we can learn from them. But before we do that, I want to just take a moment And make sure we are all on the same page when it comes to understanding what Jesus is talking about when he refers to the kingdom of heaven. In our language, when we talk about a kingdom, most of the time, what we have in mind is a realm or a territory, like the United Kingdom, which is England and Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. But in scripture, although the word kingdom can be used to describe a realm, its primary meaning has to do with the reign of the king, the royal power and authority and sovereignty of the king. And we all know this from the start of the Lord's Prayer because when Jesus teaches that prayer to the disciples, he says, pray like this, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, what's next? Your will be done. For God's kingdom to come is for his will to be done. For God's kingdom to come is for his authority, will, and sovereignty to be recognized. That is fundamentally what the kingdom is. Now, who is subject to that kingdom? Well, because God is the creator of the whole universe, everyone in creation is subject to the kingship of of God. In 1 Chronicles 29, David prays this, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. God is the king because God is the creator. And as human beings, we bear a special relationship to the creator and king of all. He has made us in his image and likeness. And just as in the ancient worlds, kings would put up statues of their likeness to represent their authority and their kingship, God has created images in his likeness. Except we are walking and talking and living and breathing images and that's why in Genesis 1 right after it says let us make man in our image after our likeness it says and let them have dominion because we are representing the authority of our great king we've been made to reign with him to serve him to work for him in other words we were made to share with God in life in service and love as our great king But we rebelled. Rather than submit to his authority, we have subverted his authority. And that's true in all stages in the Bible. It's true of all humanity from the time of Adam. True of all Israel from the time of Abraham and Moses. True even of the kings of David, including the great shepherd king himself. 
But when Jesus came in his ministry, he was announcing that God wasn't just going to let it stay this way. In his ministry, when Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Jesus was saying that God, the king, is about to set things right. He's about to recapture those who belong to him. And that would be done through the Lord's anointed, the Lord's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to prove that he was God's point man in the renewal of the kingdom, Jesus did signs and miracles like casting out demons. And he did so to prove this very point. If you go back just a couple of pages in Matthew chapter 12, you remember the debate that broke out when Jesus cast out demons and the Pharisees and scribes said that he did these exorcisms by the power of the devil. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, it says in verse 25, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will this kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. And then here's the payoff verse, verse 28. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then what? The kingdom of God has come upon you. What Jesus was showing is that in his ministry, he was exerting the royal authority of God to take back what belongs to God. Last year in the sermon, I joked with you that you could describe Jesus' ministry then as the empire strikes back, except this time it's the good guys who are winning instead of the bad guys because the kingdom of God is once again being reasserted. And what a blessing it is to be liberated from the tyranny of the the evil one who has instigated all of this cosmic rebellion and to be set free to share in the life and love and reign of God. And what scripture says is, this is only just beginning. There is both a present reality to the kingdom of God, which all of us enjoy now, who have submitted to the reign of our great king, but there is also a future dimension to the kingdom. When Jesus wins the final victory, this uh, Saturday will mark the 76th anniversary of D-Day, the event at which the Allies won the decisive victory. But there was almost a year left of fighting in Europe after that decisive victory, and a year and a few months before the victory in the Pacific Theater. And we right now, as though we are between D-Day and the final victory, we are right now a part of a kingdom which is waging its war. But we look forward to the day when, as Paul says in 1 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Lord Jesus will reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Even death itself will be the last enemy destroyed. And on that glorious and final day, we will reign with Christ when God is all in all. And the kingdom of heaven will mean eternal life and love and joy. That's the kingdom of heaven. And now I want to look at the two stories that Jesus tells about it here in Matthew chapter 13. The first of these starts like this. Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven. Now, quite often in Matthew's gospel, he will use the word heaven where other gospels use the word God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. But the phrases mean the same thing. The only difference is when scripture talks of the kingdom of God, it's placing the emphasis on the one who reigns. And when it talks about it in terms of the kingdom of heaven, it's placing the emphasis on the otherworldly nature of that reign. It's the reign not of a political and military power, but the reign of the heavenly king. So then, what is this kingdom like? It's like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Now, if you're like me, it sounds a little odd. I mean, when I think of something digging a hole and putting something in it and covering it up, I think of dogs. I don't think of people. 
But actually, in the ancient world, this was quite common because they did not have a developed banking system like we do. And quite often, they would go and they would bury valuables. You may remember in the parable of the talents, that's what the one talent man did, right? He went out and he, he buried it. Some of you know about the Dead Sea Scrolls, a great treasure of biblical manuscripts. Those were hidden in the caves in Qumran by the Dead Sea because of the fear of Roman invasion, so actually, in the ancient world, this was quite common. It was so common that we know that there were many stories passed around about peasants who stumble upon hidden treasures. It was the ancient equivalent of a story about a man named Jed, a poor mountaineer who barely kept his family fed. And then one day... He was shooting at some food and up from the ground come a bubble and crude. And some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. You are so culturally deprived. But anyway, we can identify with this story. As a matter of fact, even right now, I mean, don't do it right now. You're supposed to be listening to the preacher. But when you get home, if you look up on Google, hidden treasures discovered, you'll find all kinds of stories, uh, even about ancient treasures that are still being discovered all around the world. So... We can understand this story, they could understand it. The man who finds this treasure isn't the owner of the field because it tells us that he intends to go and buy it from the owner. Maybe if we created a backstory, he's a hired hand and he was out working the back 40 and he stumbles across it. Here's the thing Jesus tells us at the end of verse 44, then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And for some people this raises all kinds of questions. Well, how did he have enough property to sell to buy this field? And was it really ethical for him to find a treasure on someone else's property, not tell them about it, go buy the field and then take the treasure for himself? Well, if it makes you feel any better, most likely, it wasn't the owner's treasure, or else when he sold the field, he would have gone and dug it out himself. Make sense to you? Besides, don't focus on all of those kinds of ancillary details. That's like when I was a kid and I would watch Popeye cartoons, my granny would always say, now what does he do with that can after he eats the spinach? And I'm like, granny, that's not the point. He's strong. Now he's had all he can take. I won't take anymore. He's ready to fight. So don't focus on things like that. Focus on what Jesus focuses on. And here are two details Jesus gives us. First of all, he says that this man sold all that he had. Whatever this treasure was, it was so valuable that this man was willing to part with all that he owned. How much is irrelevant. The point is, 100% of it is what he was willing to sell to get this treasure. He sold it all. And second, Jesus says in verse 44, he did this in his joy. From joy, over what he found. It must have been some treasure for this man to instantly and completely reevaluate all of his priorities and part with everything he used to cherish and to do so enthusiastically. That's the first story. Now, the other story is different in some ways, but similar in its overall point. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Pearls were more highly valued as a commodity in the ancient world. I mean, we still value them. Probably in our culture, it would be diamonds if we were going to tell this story. Ancient reports speak of pearls that would be worth tens of millions of dollars in today's money. Some of you may be collectors of a different kind. When I was a young man, there was a great interest in collecting baseball cards. And if you were a part of that, you may remember what some of the most valuable baseball cards would be. Maybe some of you collect stamps or china or something like that, and you could think about what would be the most valuable piece of that collection. Unlike the man in the first story, Jesus says that this man had been searching intentionally and deliberately. 
And he finds what he's looking for. Verse 46, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now he may have been different from the first man in that he was actually pursuing what he was looking for, but just like the first man, as soon as he saw it, he knew its value and he was willing to sell everything to get it. And I would imagine, not to read too much into the story, that as a jewel merchant, he would have amassed quite a collection in his jewelry store. I mean, is that right, jewel merchant? Probably. All right, you got it. This is an authoritative word right here from the front row. But whatever he had, 100% gone to get this pearl. Two brief stories. What are we to learn from them? Here are the things I think Jesus wants us to learn. First of all, the kingdom of heaven is worth more than anything else, at least to those who know how to properly appraise value. In the previous section of parables, back up earlier in chapter 13, Jesus has already talked about someone who did not understand what was truly valuable in the parable of the sower when he says this about the thorny soil. This is chapter 13, verse 22. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proved unfruitful. The men, though, in these stories that we're studying today immediately grasped that this treasure they saw was of inestimable value. It was worth more than anything. Their value structure completely turned upside down by it. It reminds me the way the Apostle Paul describes what he had versus what he has in Christ when he says in Philippians 3, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Those are financial accounting terms. Whatever gain I had, whatever profit, whatever assets I had, Paul says, I count as loss. Those assets are a liability. It's not just simply that they have little value. It's not just that they have no value. They have negative value. They were impoverishing Paul spiritually. That is to say the pride and arrogance and self-righteousness he had as a Pharisee of Pharisees was spiritually bankrupting him. So no wonder he says that I counted it all as loss for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. If we are to embrace the kingdom of heaven, we must see that it is worth more than anything else. It is priceless. And if we are seeking something else instead, we are seeking infinitely too little. I'm sure at some point I've shared this quote from C.S. Lewis, but I think it fits so well here when he says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. The Lord Jesus is calling us to give up the mud pies for the pearl of great price. But to do so, we also need to understand from these stories that the kingdom of heaven costs us everything that we have. Both men in these stories knew that the value of what they could obtain was of such a magnitude that everything they had was expendable. The man in the field sold all that he had to find, to obtain the hidden treasure. The merchant sold all that he had to acquire the pearl. God doesn't offer us something for nothing. God offers us something for everything. It just so happens that his something is infinitely greater than our everything could ever be. 
And of course, we understand the point here is not that somehow we're going to buy our way into the kingdom or earn our way into the kingdom. That's impossible because its value is so much greater than anything we could ever merit or deserve. But the point is that to truly place ourselves under the reign of God means that there is no part of our lives that we can hold back from him. We cannot be spiritual Ananiases and Sapphiras who say they're selling out but think they can hold back a part. What scripture is teaching us here in these stories is we cannot parcel ourselves out to the great king in fractions. To commit to this king, this king, we must sell out completely. Monday afternoon, I went down to visit with Miss Virginia and with Jack to pray for her before she had her surgery the next day, and, and we talked because we've both had the experience of downsizing. They just moved into a new house and had to downsize. My, Christy and I had a much bigger house in Tennessee. We had to downsize, and we were commiserating with how difficult it is to get rid of stuff. I mean, I'm a very sentimental person, and it's very hard for me to throw anything out. Christy, she was the exact opposite. She was chucking stuff. I'm just glad she kept me when we moved down here to Florida. But anyway, as we were talking, you know, it occurred to me reading these stories, here we're talking about how hard it is to give up just a few items of furniture. Jesus says, if you want to come to my kingdom... You have to let go of everything other than your devotion to me. And for a lot of people, like the man described over in Matthew chapter 19 that we usually call the rich young ruler, for a lot of people, the price is too much. You remember this story. This man comes to Jesus, asks, what deed do I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why do you ask me what's good? There's only one who's good. You know, keep the commandments. And the man says, which ones? And Jesus lists them. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said, all these I've kept. What do I still lack? What's the answer to that question? In the list of thou shalt nots Jesus just gave him, which one is conspicuous by its absence? Thou shalt not covet. That's what this rich man lacks. He loves his stuff. And so Jesus says, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Jesus doesn't tell everybody he encounters to sell all that they have, but if it's someone he encounters whose love for their things is what's keeping them from the kingdom, he will tell that man. And the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful. You just saw someone make the worst financial transaction in the Bible. And maybe he's rich because he's pretty good at finance, but this time he blew it. He blew it eternally. Because Jesus wants him to know if you're going to come to the kingdom, you have to love God. You have to love him more than anyone or anything else. And instead for this man, that was too high a price to pay. But the man in the field and the merchant understood a good deal when they saw it. And they knew that whatever they had to give up, even if it cost everything, it was worth it to obtain this treasure. Here's the thing, though. When Jesus said to this man, go and sell all that you have, he wasn't asking him just to accept, you know, abject, mindless poverty. He offered him treasure in heaven. And when Jesus tells us, you've got to sell all that you have, you've got to give yourself completely, when he says, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me, that journey doesn't end at the cross. It ends at that moment of triumph when every knee bow and every tongue confesses and we begin to dwell in the eternal love of God's glorious kingdom. That's what he's calling us to. You just have to know how to value things. Like the men in these stories. And here's the other thing that you can see in these stories. The kingdom of heaven may be found by anyone. 
I mean, in these two stories, the men are quite different, right? The first one, by all indication, finds this treasure by accident, stumbles over it. It reminds me of the way the jailer found his hidden treasure. You know the story. Startled by an earthquake at midnight, panicked that prisoners may be escaping, completely immobilized by the fear that he's about to face a terrible penalty by Rome, so desperate that he becomes on the verge of suicide, cries out in exasperation, what do I do to get saved? And then here's something that must have been as unexpected as stumbling over a treasure in a field. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. But within the same hour of the night, that jailer's priorities totally change. He and his household believe and are baptized and just like the man who found the hidden treasure, do you remember what the text says? He and his household rejoiced that he had believed in God. And then on the other hand, the merchant had been intentionally seeking for his treasure. That reminds me of the story of the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8. Here's someone who is so diligently seeking. He leaves his home in Ethiopia, what some people in the ancient world thought was the end of the earth, to go all the way to Jerusalem to worship at a place that's not his native land. And even on the way back home, he is so diligently seeking, he's pouring over the scroll of Isaiah. And the Lord sends him Philip, and Philip preaches to him Christ from some of the same passages Jackson referred to this morning in his table talk. And the scripture says that he believed and he was baptized. And what else? He went on his way rejoicing, you know, that'd be a good time to show me you're still awake. He went on his way. Boy, that was the saddest sounding rejoicing I've ever heard in my life. I got to tell you, and I'm being honest, sometimes y'all worry me a little bit if you're really with me or not. And I'll tell you this, I'm pretty excited about this message today. And after a week like we've had, I would hope you're excited about this message too. We have an eternal priceless kingdom offered to us and it's one that we should gladly say Lord I'll give everything up to have that kind of value it's why Jesus told these stories and I don't know maybe you just stumbled in here today just well it's another Sunday to come to church I reckon I hope that you'll be awakened by the value of the kingdom that our Lord Jesus Christ is offering to us. Maybe some of us need to reevaluate what our commitment actually is to the kingdom of God. I'll tell you one thing, I have never been more motivated in my life to preach the gospel than I was last night watching what I saw on television. And what my hope is, is to go out and talk to people and show them what is of eternal value so that they're no longer out on the street, but they are here with their family, with their people, as part of the kingdom, gathered around the table to take the bread and cup that our great king gave us to remember him. That's what we've been called to, good brothers and sisters. And let us preach this message and share with people some who may be blindly going through life but would love to be surprised by the good news and others who may be searching desperately for answers. We've got a priceless message. Let's give it to them and let's live it. And if we can help you, let us know while we stand and sing.